All righty. Well, thank you everyone for joining this evening for our Christmas Bird Count 2022 kickoff. And we'll go over um, a lot of information as to how to keep track of, of the birds and how to enter data and and we'll have some bird identification as well too. This could be a year where uh, winter finches uh, are, are coming in from the north um, and we'll just see what, what happens. I know uh, evening grosbeaks have been sighted for quite a while this fall and it really isn't even early winter, but they've been around. So we'll be uh, looking for some, some fun birds. So uh, we'll, and I'll probably keep clicking people in as they join us this evening. So thanks everybody for joining. And you don't have to stay the whole time if you don't want to, but we hope you do. All right. Thank so, you for organizing. Right. Yeah. So for our date this year is on a Friday, December 30th. And it happens to fall on a weekday because you have the major Christmas holiday on one weekend. You've got the New Year's holiday on the other weekend, and I certainly didn't want to tie up uh, people's holiday weekends. So a Friday, if you can, just a couple of hours to do a, a small route, anything would be lovely that day. So, and if you have folks that are in town from out of town, yeah, have them join you, you know, do a driving route, uh, check out some of the green spaces around your neighborhood. But one other surprise, one other nice thing we have going on is we will have a wrap-up dinner, an in-person wrap-up dinner uh, on the same evening of Friday, December 30th, beginning at 6.30. And that will be at the Rocky River Nature Center. Um, it is a catered dinner. We'll have pasta uh, and there'll be some veg there'll be vegetarian, you know, meatless. Uh, and then there will be some <laughs> and stuff. And um, so we'll go through our initial checklists at that time. We'll eat, we'll have a, a little bit of uh, talking and just have fun. It won't be our final checklist because a lot, a lot of lists won't be in uh, at that time. But we'll just at least get an idea as to, you know, the different species that we've had uh, and people that people saw that are there for the dinner. So it'll be fun. It'll be a comfortable evening. And uh, I hope everyone stays well. And of course, we always look for robins and whatever else is out there. And some of our Christmas bird counts are pretty frosty and some are not quite as frosty. I like this one looking over the city. All righty, so here is our map of the Lakewood Circle. Uh, and the, the center of the circle is actually Rocky River, West Lakey area. Um, but you can see how much of our circle does extend out into the lake. Yeah, so I guess that's about what, maybe a quarter. Uh, so uh, we even go into Lorraine County, as you can see, a little bit of North Ridgeville, the little bit of Avon. Uh, our southern border is the uh, line between Middleburg Heights and Strongsville. Basically, I kind of consider the um, the turnpike, the Ohio turnpike kind of being our southern border. Um, yeah, we slop over a little bit in some areas here and around North Ridgeville, uh, Olmstead Falls, uh, Olmstead Township, uh, just because, you know, so much of our, our area is in the lake. I don't mind a little bit of slop over on land. So hey, we Nancy. just... Yes. Excuse me. Um, it seems to be cut off at the bottom. Do you have any pop-ups that need to close? I don't know how to get that little strip okay. at the bottom off without. Okay. Never mind. If it was an easy click, that was one thing, but. Yeah, I wish it were, but it does not want to go away. Yes, it is okay. a cut off a little bit. Oops. Um, all righty. So, and then again, our, our uh, whoops. come back. Where did you go? No, no, stop. There. Well, whatever um, you did, it's now showing the bottom. So you're good. Oh, 
<laughs> oh, I. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Whatever I did, which I don't know what I did. Um, but you can see Parma Heights uh, is in there uh, into the Brooklyn area and into Lakewood. Uh, we don't quite hit uh, the Cuyahoga River. So that's kind of interesting. That's kind of a no man's land, believe it or not. Um, here's some of the pins. All these little blue markings are some of the areas that we generally cover. Uh, you can see the zoo over to the east and the lakefront. And we hit uh, Bradley Woods and uh, down into um, Baldwin and Wallace Lake area, uh, Lake Abrams, Lake to Lake Trail, uh, the Cuyahoga Community College Western Campus in Parma, Parma Heights is about, again, our, our southeastern border or corner. A lot of the Rocky River Valley. And yes, there are other Christmas bird counts in the area. Um, it's National Audubon that chooses the dates of being starting on December 14th through January 5th. Um, so if you are interested in joining other Christmas bird counts this year, please, of course, save this Friday, December 30th for, for our Lakewood CBC. But certainly you can join others. And some of the other ones are the Cleveland Christmas bird count, which is this coming Saturday, December 17th. The compiler is Laura Gooch. I'm going to leave this slide up just to scooch so that you can um, take down uh, uh, email addresses. The Elyria Christmas bird count in Lorain County is also on Saturday. And that compiler is Marty Ackerman or Martin Ackerman. The Cuyahoga Falls Christmas bird count in Summit County is Sunday, December 18th with uh, Dan Toth as the compiler. Of course, our Lakewood CBC that I have it highlighted here in, in dark. Uh, so it is uh, on that Friday or December 30th. And then I didn't put the circle on the map, but uh, if you're interested in the Geauga County uh, in Burton CBC, that is in January, Monday, January 2nd. So see, they've, they've chosen a, a, a weekday as well too. And that compiler is Linda Gilbert. So again, I'm gonna leave this up for a, a few. So if you wanna do a Saturday, this coming Saturday, there's a couple choices there. Sunday, there's a choice there. And if you wanna go into January, you can do the count in, in Geauga County in Burton, but certainly do contact those compilers so that you can get on the books and they can let you know where to meet, that kind of stuff. Okay. All right, I just again wanted to toss this one up. Again, our circle, the Lakewood circle is to the left and the Cleveland is to the right. And there's the no man's land. A lot of people wonder about the Cuyahoga River in downtown Cleveland, sorry not covered. Here's just one of our little friends that we may get on that Christmas bird count. So who's your Christmas bird count contact? Me. And hopefully you'll have that jotted down all over the place. Uh, Nancy Howell at wcaudubon.org. If you have any, 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 any questions prior to the count, you know, want, wanting to know about routes, uh, feeder watching, how to tally your data, submit data, photos, yep, just contact me and I will get you information. I'm going to go over a lot of information in this presentation, but 
please remember Nancy Howell at wcaudubon.org. Super easy. If you're not as familiar with the area, um, here are some of the routes that we generally have covered. Um, some of them are covered already. Uh, Big Creek Parkway from Brook Park Road to Stump is covered. Uh, there's several other areas along Big Creek Parkway that run all the way down to Fowles Road. Uh, and they are, that, as you see, they're not highlighted, so they are not covered as of yet. Um, if, you, or if there's people that can do the small section of Big Creek Parkway at Memphis, and then move along down West 130th, there's some green spaces and parks along there. Again, it's really kind of fun to, to pick up some of the small little green areas, and you just never know what you'll find. Big Met and Little Met golf courses um, they, and Mastic uh, Golf Course, basically Lorraine Road Bridge to I-480 Bridge and the Rocky River Reservation. That one is up in the air. The person that normally or the people that normally cover that are iffy. They have family coming in. So this is a good one to uh, have to be able to cover. The Bradley Woods Huntington Reservation is uh, already taken. Baldwin and Wallace Lakes, again, uh, and this runs between Valley Parkway uh, uh, um, from Eastland Road north to Bagley or Bagley Road south to Eastland. And uh, it's not covered right now this year. I can I can use uh, some good birders along that area. It's, it's fun, it's easy, and uh, it would be nice to have that covered. The lakefronts, uh, both eastern and western section, are covered. We have usual groups that that, that uh, pick that up. And then Elmwood, Clay, and Lakewood Park cemeteries are covered. Again, there's a usual group that hits that. Oh, uh, yep, yeah, we get folks around the uh, Hopkins Airport. Uh, a little bit of the Rocky River Valley Parkway from Bagley to Lagoon Picnic Area and Coe Lake. That is a, a route that's covered. The Lake Isaac Byers Pond Main Street, uh, and that is again our southern route, Woodvale Cemetery. This is all in Middleburg Heights, and it is not covered this year. Lake Isaac is the southern terminus of the Lake to Lake Trail. So it, um, it, it's really not marked as Lake Isaac much anymore. It's, it is the Southern part of the Lake to Lake Trail. So I do not have anyone covering that. And uh, that's always a good one. The Lake to Lake Trail uh, Abrams section, basically Bagley Road to the Eastland parking lot. Um, and I think Terry Martinsick, you're on the, you're on the uh, uh, Zoom. Uh, did you have anything that you might want to add to this? Do you have a time that you're going to be meeting? Um, I think 7 a.m., uh, which is incredibly early. It at is. Eastland Road Trailhead, uh, Lake, Eastland Lake Trail. Road Trail. Okay. Um, I have an injured knee. I have arthritis in my knee and a torn meniscus. So I will be there, but I don't know how far I'll be able to walk. It's not a long walk in the first place, so we'll see. Uh, so I could definitely use some people who could walk to where the nursing home and the movie theater are and then come right. back. Um, but we can get a huge number of robins and other blackbirds in, at dawn. So it's important to be there at seven. Most of the action of the whole day can be the first 15 minutes there. But it's kind of hit and miss in winter. It's interesting how sometimes we have nothing at seven and sometimes we have maybe a thousand birds or more, um, but it's important to be there. Can that it's be always a, okay. amazing. It's, can that be a, it's always place cool in, there. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, can that be a good place in the evening when birds are coming into roost too? Absolutely, absolutely. So perhaps prior to the dinner, um, you know, if somebody could stop by and just 
<clears throat> walk out on the boardwalk and kind of get a, an idea as to, and this is again, looking at like five o'clock in the evening, uh, birds that come in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then you can also really hit a whole section, uh, Eastland Road, Sheldon Road, Engel Road, Borders. Um, there's lots of little, again, nooks and crannies. There's uh, small businesses along there and a lot of fruiting trees. So you just never know if you run into a bunch of cedar wax wings, uh, again, robins, you just never know what's in there. So think about that. You can use additional participants. The Lake to Lake Trail, basically the Fowles Road um, area, Angle Road, uh, Angle Road Sledding Hill, uh, to Bagley Road, basically Bagley Road is the north border to um, the to Fowles Road, which is the southern border. It's right along where Southwest Hospital is. And that can also be good for blackbirds, uh, sparrows. Sparrows are, can be found in that area quite easily. The puritist wetlands are not being covered this year. So that would be a nice little area to, to reach. The, as you can see, the Renaissance uh, Senior Living Center uh, and the Rocky River Nature Center trails are being covered. And uh, Michelle Brocious, uh, you'll be working with the Rocky River Nature Center trails? Yes, that's right. I'm planning to start the walk at nine that morning. Oh, nine o'clock. So, okay. Yeah. Um, right. That's what time we start the um, the second Saturday bird walk. We just, you know, had one and it seems to be a, a good time for the birds. You know, we won't be stumbling around in the dark. Um, so yeah, nine o'clock for that one. Okay. Well, that, that helps me out a lot because uh, I will, I will send people your way. I have a couple folks that are coming into town and uh, it looks as though that that's would be a really good place for them. So nine o'clock. Excellent. Thank you. Um, some of our other areas, the southwest area of, of Berea, basically the southwestern corner that uh, touches into North Ridgeville and down to the, the um, turnpike. Um, it's a driving route. Stop. Maybe you walk around some neighborhoods, some little uh, housing developments there, a park or two, and uh, it, that, that one can be hit pretty easily. Um, the cemeteries, as you can see, Sunset Memorial Park and Cemetery, Chestnut Grove Cemetery, those are all covered. The Tri-C Western Campus and the adjacent parks are also covered. Um, West Park and Holy Cross Cemeteries, and then there's a, a Key Bank wetland that you can see from 480. Um, and then the former American Greetings Complex uh, looks like they all need to be covered. And the zoo and Brookside Reservation is covered. But here's a couple of other suggestions. Uh, again, if you know somebody at another senior living community and assisted living communities, a lot of these places have, again, nice little uh, plantings of, of uh, decorative trees and could be nice. And, and a lot of them have bird feeders out too. Um, feeder watchers, we can always use, you know, if you're out in the morning uh, walking around and then maybe you're in, home in the afternoon, evening, watch your feeder for uh, an hour or so. Always need that data. Um, school yards, pocket parks, green spaces, cemeteries, anything just in your neighborhood, again, as long as it's in our circle. Um, I mentioned driving routes, hey, drive around your neighborhood, walk through your neighborhood, please do, um, just never know what you'll see. And then if you'd like to get out a little early and do some owling uh, before sunrise, look or listen for owls, I have a couple of areas that I like to hit. So these are just some suggestions and again, Nancy Howell at WC Audubon, if you see something that looks like it appeals to you. Now, of course, we have lots of things happening with uh, illnesses this winter. Of course, COVID is still around, the flu, the common cold, 
and I don't know if it's RSV or RVS, I'm not sure, but you know, that's that respiratory thing that people seem to be getting. So please, 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 please be careful. Wearing masks is really one of the best things. Hand washing, hand sanitizing. And, um, and really, it's probably not a good idea to carpool, uh, especially with people that are not family members. So just be, again, play it safe. And really, uh, I want everybody to be well and healthy and just watch yourself with, with all the things that are coming in. Ooh, owling, but this one's during the day. Look at how well that owl blends into that, to that uh, tree cavity. I probably walk right by that. <laughs> now, besides the Christmas count on the 30th, on Friday the 30th, there are some days that we can uh, consider count week. Three days prior to the count itself, and three days after the count itself. So if uh, on the count day, we are maybe you know, doing great, we, but we don't get any turkey vultures on Friday dip, December 30th. Nobody has seen a turkey vulture. However, a day after the count, somebody sees some turkey vultures floating over. Or two days prior to the count, somebody sees turkey vultures. Those are per perfectly good for us to put onto our count week total. So it's kind of fun to go out a few days beforehand. So that would be Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, December 27, 28, 29, or three days afterward, which is again, December 31st, uh, and then Sunday and Monday, January 1st and 2nd, are the three days afterwards. So keep your eyes open before and after. Now, apologies for the blurry uh, um, calendars, but I just want the important thing is, again, I have our date circled, December 30th. Please notice the green arrows, 27, 28, and 29 are those three dates that are part of count week prior to our count uh, day, and then the 31st, 1st, and 2nd are part of the count week after our count day. Hopefully that's as clear as mud. Very clear. All right. Uh, anybody that is participating, uh, I will be sending our bird checklist, and it will look similar to this. No, it will look just like this. And of course, it'll be much longer because there's a lot of birds here that I haven't, uh, that's just partial list. Um, on the line, the blank line, the area covered by you or your team. So if you're doing one route, the Stump Road route between Brook Park Road, or I'm sorry, the Big Creek Parkway between Brook Park and Stump, right in Brook, um, Big Creek Parkway, Brook Park to Stump. If you're doing the zoo, the Cleveland Zoo. Oh, but wait, what if you're doing a, a second place? You do the zoo uh, for a couple of hours and then you move on to a cemetery. You start a whole brand new checklist for the cemetery. And you record all species, rock doves, which are feral pigeons, house sparrows, European starlings, you don't have to count Kentucky Fried Chicken <laughs> or Church's Chicken or whatever that, but uh, again, any of the live birds that you see. Um, and again, consider owling. Here's how your checklist may begin to look uh, after you finish. So on my Big Creek Parkway route from snow to stump, um, we had you know, Canada geese and black ducks and mallards and gulls and heron and so far, you know, you can see the, how the list would be filled out. The folks that do the zoo, they have a kind of a fun thing and oh, and you can see how snowy this one was. Um, this one is again at the zoo, you can probably tell the Fulton Road Bridge. 
And uh, do you see the peregrine falcon in the photo? Right there, right there. Not the photo on the uh, on the sign, but the real real bird up there. So, yay! That that was a fun. That's a fun photo. All right. Another part of the data collection is keeping track of weather uh, during the day, the temperature. Uh, sky conditions, cloudy, partly cloudy, sunny. Uh, if there's any precipitation, whether it's snow, sleet, rain, and if there's snow on the ground, they'll kind of get an idea as to an average depth of snow. This is all has to be turned in by me, the compiler to National Audubon. Um, for those who are going out in groups, please try to list all the names and at least the emails of the participants in your group and really do keep to your selected or assigned route so uh, areas are not duplicated. Um, I, I, I work things out if things get duplicated, but uh, it's just easier if you uh, stick to your routes, please. So <clears throat> again, on the checklist at the very end, the data for me, Here's the weather's information. And you also see the total species and the total number of birds. If you wanna add those in, that'll be at the end of that checklist that I'll be sending to everyone. Here on the checklist will also be a place for the names of participants and their email addresses. There'll be about a half a dozen, five, six uh, places to put in that information. Yep, another thing that I have to tally up are the times that people are out and the distance, either driving or walking. Um, keep track of the hours and miles walked one way. That's how eBird measures the distance as one way. Uh, hours and miles driven, again, only during the count, one way. If you do take a break, let's say you're out in the morning for a couple of hours, walking a route, good, you've got down the hours, you've got down the miles that you've walked, but then you're like, yeah, let's stop at Dunkin' Donut and, and have a cup of coffee and a donut or a, a breakfast. Don't keep, don't keep track of hours there. Um, you just take a little break. And then if you start up again a little bit later, you know, say a half an hour later, um, start your, your time once again, your distance, your hours, as well as your miles, either walked or, or driven. If you are feeder watching, of course, you don't have to sit and watch your feeder 24-7. Um, but you know, you, you look out 15 minutes and you're watching your feeder and you're tallying things and then, oh my, gotta go fold the clothes or whatever, or wash some dishes. And then you come back um, half an hour later and watch the feeder a little longer. So just track the length of time that the, that the feeder is being watched. So 15 minutes plus 15 minutes plus 20 minutes, doesn't have to be watched continuously, just add things together. So again, this type of information will be on your checklist and this information is incredibly important. So if I'm walking, I've already spent four hours on foot, about three miles, half an hour in the car, going slowly, about five miles, stopping maybe at a couple places. And then I spent an hour and a half watching the feeder. So total number of hours, six hours, total number of miles, eight miles. Yep, I got to add all this up. It's great fun getting all the data in. And you can see some of our bird uh, Christmas bird counts are pretty mild. This one, no snow at all.
Um, I like to have our checklists uh, either entered uh, or given sent to me through eBird. Or if you use the checklist that I will be sending to all of you, you can take a photo of it and, and scan it, send it to me. Um, you can, I guess, mail it to me. That takes an awfully long time, but eBird is really the best for me. Now, I know eBird has some information as to how to um, send a trip report, and it can be created for your route or a day sightings. And so really take a look at that eBird information if you use eBird. Um, and that's really especially useful for driving routes where you do several stops along, along the way, say like along the lakefront. I, I only had one person use it last year and it was, it was a little hard for me to, to decipher. So again, I like, I like eBird. I like, again, the checklist, the paper checklist that you take a photo of and sent in. Um, scan it in any way, but get it sent to me, Nancy Howell at wcaudubon.org. Again, keep a separate list for each area that you're doing. Don't forget names and addresses of participants, weather conditions, the hours on foot, uh, in car, miles on foot, in car, and feeder watch. All right, so what if I do see a rare or unusual bird or something that I'm not quite sure what it is? Um, record a, a detailed description of its appearance. Um, if you are able to take a photo, terrific. And I will be sending a rare bird documentation to you. I'm not going to put that on this, this, uh, this program because it just needs to be filled out in as best as possible. Um, but just really understand that if you, if I send a, a, a rare bird or a unusual bird report uh, thing to you, it is not questioning your sighting. National Audubon would like information uh, and the, me as a compiler, I have to send it to a regional compiler and they will often come back to me saying, does anybody have a picture of that bird? Or uh, can you do a better description of what you saw? So please, again, this is not questioning your sightings at all. It's basically verifying rare or unusual birds. Like this one, yeah, we, in 2020, we had some black vultures hanging around along with turkey vultures. And uh, so a nice photo of a couple of black vultures trying to stay warm at a, a, a warm air vent on top of, um, I believe this was Holy Family Church and school. So let's say you can't really identify a bird. What should you do? Again, if you're able to get a photo, that's great. Uh, or write down a detailed description, size, where the certain colors were, uh, and we can help with, with identification. Or um, I can go out and look for uh, the bird in a particular area if I know where you were, were uh, found that unusual species. Don't forget, um, weather conditions can change at a moment's notice. So uh, dress in layers, keep good footwear, warm footwear, dry footwear, um, have, a, have a mask for COVID just in case. Um, hand warmers are a real good investment. Those, those disposable ones that you can pick up at drugstores or whatever. Um, binoculars, and if you have a spotting scope, you'll know, have that in your car. That's really good for looking over fields or open areas. And there are a couple of resources through National Audubon. Um, you could just Google National Audubon Society, Christmas Bird Count, 
and there will be information that can come up too. So, and you can look at our, our archives on the Western Cuyahoga. It lists all the different bird counts in the lists over the years. I like this glaucous gall in the winter time. Okay. First of all, does anybody have any questions? Anything that, that you might want for me to answer at this point? I do. Everything's semi-clear? But yeah, remember- I've got, I've, got, have... I've got a couple questions. Oh, okay, fantastic. Um, one of them was, is who, I'm new to this group, so I'm not really on the, uh, the no with a lot of things, mm -hmm. um, who covers Brexville? That is not in our, there's <clears throat> nobody that covers Brexville. Okay. There had been a Southern Cuyahoga circle, but that dropped away a couple years ago because there was no compiler, but no, nobody does Brexville. Oh, what do you mean there was no compiler there? Oh. There was they had a circle, they started a circle, but then that person left and nobody took it over. Does that mean you still don't want data from it? I mean, what if, what if I just went out and kind of randomly went around Brexville and just turned that in? I mean, do we it need It wouldn't to... go anywhere. Oh. Because it's not a count circle. Okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> There's yeah, a that's... lot of eagerness, yeah. I mean, the Cuyahoga River would be a wonderful area to count as well, too, but right. not in our count circle. Okay, so then also, like you said that there was uh, a lot of, you know, different areas were covered already by quote unquote, the uh, usual groups that cover right. it. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that the same group of people get to cover the same area all, every year, like Pretty much, um, and a lot of it is because they have access to some private properties, especially along the lakefront. Um, yeah, they usually have their, their routes that they do. Okay, but what about like somebody new like myself that would like to do the lakefront? Does that mean I could never join the group with the lakefront because that's already an established group? I can see if the groups that are doing the lakefront, if they would, um, I, I'd have to let you know where they're meeting and that kind of stuff. So I can I can find out, yeah, the Western section of Lake Erie, um, so which is Bay Village, West Lake, that kind of stuff. Um, I can I can talk with the, the group leader there and let you know where they're gonna meet. Okay, uh, but before you do that, you know, let me first determine whether I'm making it so we can okay. pick this up later. I don't want you doing footwork when I'm not even going to be able to show. Yeah, right, right. Got um, it. So what is the final sign up? You know, when do you close out signing up for this Christmas bird count? Um, I like to have information from people in by Wednesday, December 28th. No, I mean, I mean, the count itself is wait. the 30th. Oh, so the cutoff is the 28th? For me to, you know, make sure you've signed up or some other folks have signed up. Yeah, yeah it just it just helps me out uh, to give me a little bit of time between, uh, you know, the start of the count and and people signing in. Or signing okay. up. And then what about signing up for the dinner at Rocky River? What's the cutoff date for that? You just come. There's no cutoff date. Oh, there's no count or taken or like, are you coming? Are you not? So we know how much food to bring. It's... Uh, I just, I just have lots of food. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Yep. Do you want people to bring stuff? If people can bring a dessert to share, that would be lovely. You know, you got all those extra holiday cookies and you're like, I don't want these in my house anymore. <laughs> okay. So that would be, that would be lovely. Wait, wait, wait. So the, the, okay. Friday, December 30th is the actual thing. Okay. I, I've got to get my things around. So what about times? Like, 
Okay, so you've got a group that's already working the lakefront. Um, what times are they operating on? Like, I mean, do they stop at a certain time or do they decide, what, do they go four hours? Do they go eight hours? That is up to the group to sometimes they double, uh, they check an area uh, at one point, then they might go back if they hear that there's something rare in the area. So it's, it's hard to tell. Okay. They usually start like, 7 30 8 o'clock 8 30 that kind of stuff all right but but it's not like they stop at you know four or something like that necessarily um it it just depends on that group um, okay i have i've was, never done a i've never done a lakefront group so yeah because what i was getting at was like well if they are going out from you know eight in the morning till noon you know that leaves noon on uncovered. You know what I'm saying? Like, are they covering all the times of the day as well? Some groups will go those few hours in the morning, take and a break, it, and then call it a day. And some will call it a day. Uh, some groups will pick up a, a second route in the afternoon, or do some feeder watching in their in the their home. Gotcha. So, so if I wanted to, if I determine I'm available, um, I should talk to who's running that lakefront group. I, I can talk, I will be the liaison between. The liaison, okay, okay, yeah. Because, you know, I mean, I was thinking if they wrap up, you know, most of them at, you know, noon or two or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, I'd be more than willing to be coming out at three. And doing yep. you know, three to seven or something like that. I'm just wondering whether if they don't do that, would they entertain bringing in somebody to pick up the tail end? Yeah, right. You with me? Um, or right. or hitting or hitting a different area, you know, that sure. hadn't been hasn't been covered. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, I believe that's uh, all my questions right now. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer those. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think a lot of people probably have a, the a similar questions, and you know, I always I always need people to to mop up <laughs> the places that aren't covered. Um, and a lot of times I do that. I'm like driving around like a crazy person. Ah. Yeah. See, this is Catherine Clark. I have a question on that Puritus green space. Oh yeah. Where where is that? But in relation to Memphis, um, it's right off of of Memphis, as far but, as I know. Okay, I, um, I would like where the Kitty Park used to be. Yeah, yeah, um, down that yes. right yeah. there where, okay, where Teeterman goes into Memphis. I wonder yeah. if that's the because you know yeah, it's I, just a, it's just, just a small section of Big Creek of the Big Creek right. Reservation. Yeah, I mean, I would be willing to go down there on the 30th. You know, I don't oh, give you a time right now, but but in the morning, you know, not not seven o'clock. I can tell no, you that no, right nope, now, nope. <laughs> but that's OK. Um, but I would be interested in going there because that's okay. somewhere I can just drive and then get out. And walk. I've been to that park down okay. there. Yep, yep, yep. Fantastic. So, Thanks. Just to put in about one of Judy's good points about trying to be real thorough about like the lakefront. Uh, of course, it's always possible that same raft of uh, mergansers are there, you know, they haven't moved much. And so you have to sometimes subtract <laughs> possible duplications. Um, good point. That is a good point. You know, birds move. Um, you know, the, the birds that are seen at, say, Edgewater could move west, or birds that are west could move east. Are they double counted? Uh, you know, that's it's always hard to tell. Um, that's why, again, the, the folks that do the lakefront are really good at what they do. They know where to stop. They know where to go back. Um, they keep in contact. Sometimes they even divide up and hit different areas and say, oh, hey, there's a, a long-tailed duck heading your direction, you know, or there's three long-tailed ducks, or, have you, do you see them, that kind of stuff. So 
they've got it down pat. Um, it's just like an area that I cover and you know that I know where to look for certain things. Um, yeah, so that's just part of, of the Christmas count is the geese that might fly over my neighborhood are geese that might you might see Ken somewhere else. <laughs> you just never know. Right. It's just I'm not familiar with any of the territories that you have listed, but I, except for the lakefront. I know the lakefront uh -huh. like the back of my hand. I've I, all the way from Sandusky to Erie. Oh, okay. You know I mean, I run up and down that lakefront like as if it's my uh, second place of residence. So okay. That's, why, okay. that's why I wanted to target that because I'm yeah. extremely yeah. familiar with how to get in and get around and where to yeah. go. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Fantastic. I am jotting this down. All right, ready for some bird ID? Good. All righty, so keep your eyeballs open. Speaking of Canada geese, keep your eyeballs open for little tiny Canada geese like the one in the center. Uh, you notice that there's actually three sizes of Canada geese here. There's big, tall ones. It's not just because their necks are stretched out. There are different subspecies of Canada goose, um, the giant, which are the ones that we tend to have around. And then there's some kind of medium sized one, but the, the cackling goose, which is actually a separate species, not much bigger than a mallard duck. Short neck, short stubby beak, so, you know, scan through those Canada geese. You might run into a cackling goose. Um, if there's a white goose in among the Canadas, you may have a snow goose or a, a Ross's goose. We've had them uh, in counts as well. When people are looking at, at waterfowl, um, a, a big challenge are things like the uh, American black duck versus mallard, the female mallard. Um, I think of these birds as the mallard, the female mallard is milk chocolate, all right? So kind of a lighter brown with all the markings on it. The blue on the wing, you don't always see that. It's called the speculum, and that is blue in a mallard, and it's bordered by black and white. The American black duck, I think of it as dark chocolate. Lighter colored head, but a very dark body. You can, you can barely see the markings like you see on the female mallard. The speculum, again, that shiny blue place on the on the feathers on the wing is more of a purplish rather than blue and it is bordered by black there uh, is no are no white feathers along those edges so keep your eyeballs open if you see groups of mallards and uh, telling the difference between american black duck and the female mallards <laughs> you normally look for possible hybrids Yep, like this guy. Um, this is a hybrid black duck mallard. And you can see the body is, is this is a male. He should have a green head if he were a mallard and a white ring around the neck and a chestnut colored breast and a grayish body. But this bird is, well, it's got a light colored head, but a little shine of green on it. It's got dark markings all around the body it's got that purplish speculum so this is a this is a black duck mallard hybrid and they can vary a bit uh, they may not have as much green they may be a little darker bodied um, so keep your eyeballs open for them too And of course, anybody doing the lakefront, got to know those galls. Uh, of course, herring galls and ring-billed galls are really pretty much the more common ones. You see dark, a dark gall, it's first year or the hatch year herring galls. It takes several years for the herring galls to reach their adult plumage. 
in the winter time, herring gulls have the speckling on the neck, back of the head, but a herring gull has that red spot on the lower mandible and pink legs. Ring-billed gulls, again, a ring around the beak, smaller than a herring gull, and they have yellow legs and feet. Now, there are a couple of other gulls, the Bonaparte's gull, which is a very small, pretty gull. And then there are also, um, well, you're looking at a flock of gulls and you see a gull that's very, very white, um, Glaucus gulls. There may be the great black-backed gull out there, which is a very big dark-backed gull. So anybody doing the lakefront, know your gulls. I haven't seen a whole lot of turkey vultures this year. There's still a few around and I haven't seen any black vultures in the usual area, but just wanna cover um, turkey vultures, deep brown color with the red head and in flight, the long wings that are very silvery underneath, a fairly longish tail, a short stubby head, the black vulture, all black, black face, uh, black beak, black body, but the silvery patches are at the tips, the primary feathers on the wings when they're flying. And they have a much shorter tail. Plus they fly more, much more butterfly-like. Uh, they, they flap a whole lot more than turkey vultures. So we'll see if they were, are around this year. Sharp-shinned and Cooper's hawks are often confused. The Cooper's hawk on the left, good-sized bird, um, slim, long tail with a dark cap. And this is an adult bird with the uh, rusty markings in the front and that slate gray back. Sharp-shinned hawk not much bigger than a blue jay and it has a dark cap plus the nape so that darkness runs all the way over the head to the back of the head a little stubby beak it may have a lot of white markings on these uh, scapular feathers on the feathers on the wings that, but not always and again, a, a, a longish tail that's much more flat or squared at the tip, whereas the Cooper's hawk has a much more rounded tail and often has the white band at the tip. Who has the white band? It looks like they both do. This one, not as much, but you can see a much clearer white band on the Cooper's hawk at the tip of the tail. And this is adult birds now. If they're juvies, if they're the young of the year, they're gonna be much more speckled. Um, you can see the Cooper's Hawk on the left has a much more rounded tail. The head extends beyond the wing bends. The Sharpies, a, a much uh, straighter tail, not quite the and the, of course you see one tail is flared out whereas the other one is, is folded in, but has a, a not quite as, um, the, the sharp shinned hawk, not quite as rounded a tail and the head barely extends beyond the bend in the wing. But remember, uh, sharp shinned hawks, not much bigger than a blue jay, Cooper's hawk, crow sized, even a slightly long, or even slightly bigger. Red-tailed and red-shouldered hawks, both are easily found on our, our sites. Of course, red tails that are adults have the nice red tail, red shoulders, reddish breast, and this checkerboard black and white wing plus black and white stripes on the tail. 
The red-tailed hawk tends to be our more common hawk that you see along freeways, but I've seen plenty of red shoulders too. Now, if they're the young of the year, again, a red-tailed hawk, bulky bird, um, very light in front. So the breast and, and the, the belly tends to be light. Sometimes they'll have a lot of flecking along the belly, like a, a belt or belly band. And a good number of markings on the back, almost like a V-shaped set of white markings along the back. Whereas the red shoulder, you have uh, almost teardrop shaped uh, feathers on the breast to the belly. And you almost can see that checkerboard pattern, but instead of being black and white, like on the adult bird, on the immature bird, it is tan and brown. Downy and hairy woodpeckers, don't you just love it when they're at the feeder and right next to each other? <laughs> You're, of course, you probably are not going to see that all the time, but this is a nice comparison. You can see how much larger the hairy woodpecker is on the left versus the downy. A long beak, basically the beak is almost as long as the head length from the base of the beak to the back of the head. Whereas a downy's beak, it's dinky, uh, only about half the length of the head from where the beak attaches to the head to, again, just beyond the eye a little bit. So very short. Um, another way to tell is hairy woodpeckers have this black spur in front of the wing, whereas downies do not. And hairy woodpeckers do not have any flecking on these outer tail feathers, whereas downies may have a little, some, a few dark markings. I don't see any on this one. It's very hard to see, but you can clearly see this one is on the hairy, does not have any markings at all. Kestrels, not real common on our on our circle, uh, but Merlin can be a little bit more common, especially on that Tri-C Western campus. I've had them at the um, Cuyahoga County Fairgrounds. Again, any place that's kind of semi-open with trees, so cemeteries are good places to watch for them. Um, but female kestrel, very brownish with a lot of uh, the blue on the top of the head and then the markings by the eye. The male kestrel, much more rusty with the blue wings, blue-gray wings. And then the merlin, almost about the size of a kestrel, but gray above. Um, females are much more brown. Um, you'll, you'll notice a difference, if you will. Winter in Carolina wrens. Carolina wren, pretty good sized wren on the right. Nice and, and uh, buffy, uh, bright white eye stripe above the eye. Very loud. Uh, if they're calling, singing, they are just like there. Whereas the winter wren, oh, they are mouse-like. They are tiny, uh, about half the size of a Carolina wren. Uh, short stubby tail dark brown or uh, browner above and a lot darker uh, flecking uh, below, but they like to hide. They like brushy areas and uh, they give a, a jip, 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 jip call. So if you see something that looks like a mouse and you're like, well, that was awful brown, get your eyes peeled because you could have winter in around. Both golden and ruby crown kinglets can be found. Uh, golden crowns tend to be a little bit more common than rubies. Um, watch flocks of 
chickadees, titmouse, those, those mixed flocks. Uh, there may be some kinglets mixed in among them. Uh, of course, they're a little smaller than, than uh, uh, chickadees and they move around a lot. But you can see the golden crown kinglet has the slightly darker cap with uh, either a, a yellowish stripe, a little more yellow on the wings, a little black stripe through the eye, whereas the ruby crowned, uh, no marking on the head that you can see easily, but this big white around the eye almost gives them that surprised appearance. A lot of people forget to look at starlings and they are quite pretty in the winter time. Um, all these little dark, uh, I'm sorry, all these little white feathers and the rusty feathers on the back will eventually wear away to by springtime, but this is what they look like in the winter time. The beak's a little darker. Uh, often they're mixed in with flocks of robins or cedar waxwings. And if you're anywhere around fruiting trees, especially those calorie pear that have the soft mushy fruit that robins, cedar waxwings and starlings do feed on. So uh, up and down neighborhood um, streets with tree lawns that have these, the calorie pears that have been planted by the city. Again, don't forget about winter finches. As I mentioned earlier, evening grosbeak. There's the male on the left, female on the right. Um, often traveling in good sized groups, but not always. They will come to feeders. They like um, the, uh, the ash seeds, trees of uh, the seeds of ash trees, as well as box elder. So you can see just that, that beautiful yellow color blending into the kind of the grays and greens around the head and neck of the male, the female much more gray, but look at the beak. I mean, we're talking about cardinal sized beak, even a slightly larger, big honking beak. House finch and purple finch are often confused. So on the left, you've got a purple finch that has a color more like a deep red wine, a burgundy wine. Uh, but you also notice that the male purple finch and the female purple finch have the dark brown uh, line or actually a bold line through the eye. Whereas the house finch is generally less purple in color, much more of a reddish color, and you don't see that broad line through the eye. Uh, you see a lot more streaking on the flanks and the belly of the house finch. That's the male house finch on the right. House finch females are a little on the less colorful side, as you can see, again, uh, kind of bland face, a lot of markings underneath. <clears throat> but again, winter finch is the pine siskin that, wow, they kind of look a bit alike, don't they? Lots of streaking, but pine siskins are about the size of an American goldfinch, of where they sometimes hang with goldfinch or come to thistle or niger feeders. But look at that thin beak on the pine siskin, all right? Whereas a house finch has a much, much heftier beak. Let's go back to the male. You can see a much heftier beak on the house finch. And whereas the pine siskin, a thin beak. Uh, pine siskins and goldfinch will go to uh, sycamore trees and the, the, the seed balls on sycamores. They will probe into sweet gum pods. They will go after seeds that are on alder trees and shrubs, as well as some ornamental, um, uh, some of the ornamental birch trees that people may have. 
So again, cemeteries are good places because a lot of times ornamental trees are in those cemeteries. I tossed in the pine siskin again, comparing it with the common red pole. Again, this could be a, a win, one of the winter finches that joins us uh, as the weather gets bad, uh, worse. Um, but you can see a lot of streaking on the common red pole, a lot of streaking on the siskin. But the red pole is well named. They do have a little spot of red on their top of the head, the pole. <laughs> Then they have the black around the base of the beak, like a, a goatee, the male having a little bit more black around the face and a little bit more red uh, on the head and often on the breast, females a little less. But they'll like, again, hang around with siskins. They will hang around with American goldfinch. And you may see them on goldenrod flowers. Uh, so in old in fields where there there may be seeds from um, oh iron ironweed and Joe Pie weed things like that, but they'll come to feeders too. Sparrows, watch those sparrows. The song sparrow on the left, with the streaking on the breast, a center breast spot. And these uh, kind of a mustache coming down from the corner of the beak down to the throat. The fox sparrow has a lot of breast streaking, but notice they're more chevron shaped. They're really not stripes. And much, much, much more rusty red. That's a good sized sparrow, almost twice the size of a song sparrow. Notice how much grayer the face is on a fox sparrow. Just a really beautiful sparrow. Love them. Swamp sparrows are good birds to look for in wetland areas and old fields. Um, not as much streaking on the breast. Quite a gray face and reddish on the wing. They may have just a scotch of white on the throat as in the middle photograph. Do not confuse them with a white-throated sparrow. White throats have uh, some other markings, but you can see reddish on the wing, a little bit of a white throat, much more gray face. The white-throated sparrow here on the right. This one is not a well-marked bird, but you'll see these, these tan forms, brownish forms, as well as the bold black and white ones. But white throat, this yellow spot between the eye and the beak, called a lor or super laurel, just a little above the beak. Um, not very many streaks, if any streaks at all, on the breast. American tree sparrows, as you can see, will come to feeders. Um, rusty cap, central breast spot. Here's a nice view of a side of the bird uh, showing the grayish face. White wing bar, again, no stripes on the bird's breast, but that central breast spot that can be seen. Shipping sparrows are not super common in the winter here. But if, if they are around, uh, they will not have the rusty red cap with the black line through the eye. No central breast spot. Oh, and the American tree sparrow, bicolored beak. Top beak, blackish gray, lower mandible, yellowish. And you don't see that on the chippy. The white crowned sparrow, uh, young of the year birds will have this rusty cap, pink beak. They're a big, they're a pretty good sized sparrow. Very grayish, just really pretty. An adult bird will have bold black and white stripes on that head. But again, quite plain face. The inset shows a field sparrow, which also has a pink beak. But they're tiny, they're 
about half the size of a white crowned sparrow. We see a, a white eye ring here. And uh, again, not quite the bold markings that you see on the white crown. And here's a really beautiful white-throated sparrow, very well marked. White throat, bold black and white stripes. Look at that yellow lore. <laughs> Just a pretty bird. Blackbirds, yep, they're around. Um, they're, they seem to be hanging around a little bit more than they used to. Um, so red-winged blackbird male, you may not see, of course, the bright red and yellow on the wing. They may hide that. Um, they can pull those feathers over it to hide it. The female, oh, so many people confuse that with the sparrow, but take a look at that long uh, blackbird beak. And often they have some orangish to yellowish around the face, but they are seem to be becoming more common uh, uh, in the winter time, especially around feeders where there might be cracked corn, sunflower seeds, that kind of stuff. Rusty blackbirds are a possibility, uh, but you can see a rusty blackbird has a pale colored eye and is quite well named, a lot of rusty feathers on it. The females tend to be much more brownish, but again, look at that eyeball. They're about the same size, uh, red wings and rusties. Rusties tend to walk along uh, wetland areas, uh, walking into the water, uh, tossing leaves around, looking for invertebrates and things to feed on. I just, I love watching them. They're one of my faves. Brown-headed cowbirds may be mixed in with some of the blackbirds. Male brown-headed cowbird, shiny brown brown head, seed cracking beak, common grackle, big blackbird, shiny blue gray, or I'm sorry, bluish purple in the front, uh, may have some greenish sheen to the body, big long beak, but has a yellow eye. Compare with that with the rusty, I think you can see a nice difference there. Look back and forth. And one of the few warblers that sticks around is the yellow rumped warbler. It is quite brown, as you can see, um, yellow on the rump. You may have a little yellowish wash on the side of the breast. If you know where there's poison ivy that's been growing or poison ivy fruits, keep your eyeballs open for yellow rumped warblers. That is one of their favorite foods in the winter. Um, they will also be with mixed flocks of chickadees and titmouse and uh, woodpeckers, nuthatches. So watch those mixed flocks that come by. Um, you may just run into a yellow rumped warbler or two in those mixed flocks, especially if there's poison ivy. And we had lots of photographers add to our, our, our show here. Just wanted to acknowledge them. And I want to thank everybody for being here this evening. Please consider a membership to Western Cuyahoga Audubon, which is very easy to do. And I'm going to stop sharing. Stop sharing. Thank you, Nancy. Okay, so if there are any questions, let me see. There looks like there's a question in the chat or maybe, oh, thank you. Okay, yes. All right, so somebody had to leave there. Nothing major in the chat. Really, the best thing to do if you have any questions is to reach out to me. And again, Nancy Howell at wcaudubon.org. That's it. Yeah, I got a question. Um before you go one of you know i do a lot of thinking about this you know all these uh different sets of birds that are confusing like the hairy versus the 
um, Downey Woodpecker, and you know, so you you covered, you did a great job covering a lot of that territory of those kind of very close looking things and how to look in, you know, a little closer. Um, but one thing that you, you didn't have, and I was just wondering if if maybe it was just something you had a reason for not including it or whether um, it just, you didn't have enough time or space or whatever, but it was a comparison of the um, white-breasted nuthatch and the red-breasted. Because at a distance, I mean, I know this from my own feeders in my own backyard, from a distance, they kind of can look almost the same. It's, you know, it's like not until I get the binoculars out that I can see, oh my, we got some different things going on here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I took those out. Um, I mean, I could have covered a lot more gulls as well. Sure. And, uh, you know, more with some of the sparrows. And I did take out the uh, white and red breasted nuthatch. Um, easiest way, of course, both of them are going to go tend to go down trees head first uh, or on feeders head first. Uh, the red breasted nuthatch tends to have more of a rusty breast can be bright rust or can be very dull depending on male or female. But the red-breasted nuthatch has a, a black line going through the eye, right? So it has the black cap plus the black line going through the eye. Plus they sound like little little tin horns when they're calling, toot, 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 as opposed to the <laughs> of a white-breasted nuthatch. If I also notice that the red breast is much seems much smaller than the white. It breast. is. It is smaller. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not quite half the size, but about uh, I would guess by two thirds of the size. And they have been around, and they haven't been around. I haven't noticed too many people uh, acknowledging them, but um, they'll they'll be coming to feeders, and they tend to like pines a little bit more than deciduous trees but you know birds don't read the books <laughs> yeah i've had the red breasted in my yard here on snow road in parma for probably three weeks now on a oh, regular good. basis right. with the white ones the white ones are always here yeah but the, yeah. the, the reds have showed up and almost every day we see at least a couple of them ah oh, good for you yeah see they come and go from my yeah. area yeah, this is the first year I've ever seen the reds in my backyard. So oh, fun. And, and where do you live, Judy? I can't remember. I'm in Brexville. Oh, you are in Brexville. Okay. Yeah. So the one, Nancy, the one thing that surprised me this year was the tufted titmice. I've been putting shelled peanuts out in my window feeder for the blue jays to keep the squirrels out of them. And the little tufted titmice will come in, they'll take that whole shelled peanut they're out of here they'll yeah, just yep. grab it and take off with it and they have such a little beak it's amazing yep <laughs> all righty well again i thank everybody um again keep in touch um uh, i know there's some areas that need to be covered and i know there are some folks that would like to perhaps be out just for a part of the day or watch your feeder uh really appreciate you being part of the part of our program this evening. It's a nice program. Thank you. Thank you. I wish All I could right. do more. I'll just mainly do feeder, I think. Yeah, okay. But uh, had a brown, brown creeper, bluebird, red breasted, all close together to this week, but oh, wonderful. Was, they don't wonderful. always come during the count week. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But thank you. All righty. Say hello to Don. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Thank you again. All right. Good birding. Thank you.